Yes, yes, here we are again. Seku Smith in Atlanta, John Schumann in New Jersey. My main man, how are you, Shu? I'm good. Let's start talking about the uninspiring Southeast Division. <laughs> I was I was thinking, how do you lead into an absolute intersection of uncertainty and brutal projections for some of these teams in the Southeast Division? We've been going around previewing all of the divisions in the NBA here on the Hang Time Podcast. We are down to our last couple. Kicking it off right now with the Southeast. Southwest Division will be coming up after this, but today we're going to focus on the always interesting, I won't say it's intriguing, but certainly interesting Southeast Division where things could change you. Training camps are already underway for everybody. There's Jimmy Butler out there floating around in the ether as potential trade bait for somebody. He's requested his trade from the Minnesota Timberwolves. The Miami Heat, a team that looks to move to the front of the Southeast Division this year potentially, is mentioned as a potential destination for Jimmy Butler. Before we dig in on the Heat roster, Sands Butler, I'm just curious. Do you think, looking at what they have, that Jimmy Butler is the kind of player they should trade for? Does he put them back in the star business in the NBA? I think they have nothing to lose. Right now, they are locked in basically to seven vets that have at least two years left on their contract. They're all solid players, you know, solid to decent players, but none of them is the caliber of a Jimmy Butler or or really anything close. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I think they should definitely try to shake things up. You know, not only do they sort of have a universally decent but not great roster, but they also have you know, no flexibility next summer to get in the free agency sweepstakes of 2019. In the pantheon of phrases that I've heard that make me laugh, what is universally <laughs> decent? Like, what is... <laughs> like, they have a, a lot of good players, but no, nothing. <laughs> they have the greatest amount of... The most robust amount of mediocre so The players? range of quality in their roster is not high. Like, okay. it goes from decent and to... Uh, to good. <laughs> That's it. Well, let me put it to you this way, Shu. Is this the ideal scenario if you're Pat Riley? And like you said, you don't have the sort of flexibility to get out there in free agency next summer and go crazy. Does getting a Jimmy Butler make up for that? And is that the residual of signing all those guys to the contracts you did the past couple of years, putting you in a position to, to acquire a Jimmy Butler? I guess. I mean, it also depends on, you know, what Minnesota likes. I mean, they control where he goes. You know, you have to give them enough to make the deal. I know the idea of putting it out there that Miami is his preferred destination or maybe the only place he wants to go, who knows, is going to turn other teams off, right? Right. To give Minnesota less leverage with other teams and then therefore the packages that other teams could offer aren't as good. And then Miami, you know, they have to basically settle for what Miami gives them. But even just adding Jimmy Butler to what they have right now doesn't necessarily take the heat into the top three in the Eastern Conference, which we've discussed at length. I think all those three teams are still better. Yeah. But like I said, they have nothing to lose. Like they are a, you know, as they stand, the Heat are basically the easiest team to predict in the Eastern Conference, I think. You know, they're just a, a team that is a 39 to 45 win team mm. that will be a tough out on any given night. They play hard in general. They play defense, but they just don't have one or two players that really are a matchup nightmare for anybody, you know, and they don't have the impact guys that you want to really be a serious contender just in the conference itself. I think something else that would be interesting is if they get Jimmy Butler in Dwayne Wade's farewell season, you know, how do you manage sending Wade off and welcoming Butler at the same time without, and I know these guys know each other, obviously, and, you know, have a connection or whatever, but I'm saying that seems like a weird dynamic to manage if you acquire Jimmy Butler. And listen, I'm a firm believer that you get talent when you can get it. And this Heat team certainly has quality players, but like you said, doesn't necessarily have that over-the-top superstar player. Shoot, I don't know if Jimmy Butler's that guy. I don't know if he makes me feel like, yeah, you know, this is the superstar that you build around if you're Miami. I mean, I don't, and I like Jimmy Butler's game, but I don't know if I love him as my marquee superstar. Yeah, you would think that he's probably best fit as the second best player on a good team, especially offensively. You need somebody else to sort of balance things out. He was not particularly great as the sort of go-to guy down the stretch of games for Minnesota last year. But like I said, I think he's an upgrade over whatever the Heat have right. on their roster. And it, I'm curious as to see if they do some work out of trade, what is it that they give up? You know, I like Josh Richardson a lot, and I imagine he would be a great fit in Minnesota. Sure. I think the Heat would 
try to hold on to him. And then, you know, Bam Adebayo is the other guy that really intrigues me on this roster. Mm -hmm. So you're saying you don't want Hassan Whiteside? (laughs) (laughs) Not for $53 million over the next two years, no. We're just speculating right now as far as what might happen with these guys. But I think we could, you know, just evaluate the roster as it stands. And I think there's still just questions. If they don't make a trade, I think there's some intriguing questions with this roster for this season, starting with the centers, like with Whiteside, Kelly Olynyk, and Adebayo. Whiteside, like I said, $53 million over the next two years. And I, I think they're still trying to keep him engaged and still trying to get more out of him. But so far, I think it's been a regrettable investment that they've made. I'll give these numbers from last year. Whiteside, Adebayo, and Olenek all played between 1,200 and 1,700 minutes. Whiteside was a minus 77 for the season. Mm -hmm. Uh, Bam Adebayo was a minus 33. Kelly Olenek was a plus 233. They were at their best with Olenek on the floor. You know, part of that is there's some context with that. You know, he played a lot of minutes with Ellington and Josh Richardson. And, you know, that's more of a floor floor spacing unit. Um, than they had with their starters. But Adebayo, I think, is the project. I mean, I was fairly early to jump on the uh, the BAM wagon, <laughs> as we call it. I have a seat right next to uh, Heat.com's Cooper Moorhead Coop. on the BAM wagon. <laughs> Me and Cooper, right, sit next to each other on the BAM wagon. He's got some skills. He's only just turned 21. And you just if you watched him closely last year, like you just saw flashes of things, both offensively and defensively, that tell you that this guy could just be this team's starting center for the next seven or eight years. Yeah. Yeah. And so I'm fascinated to see what happens with this, this sort of their big rotation. And obviously, it's also a huge year for Justice Winslow in the last year of his rookie deal. Yeah. Winslow is the the one guy to me. If you look at the players in that class, Shu, a lot of them are still trying to sort out who and what they're going to be in this league. I think now is the time when you invest in Justice Winslow stock. I think, you know, it came off an injury last season, quitted himself well, but maybe didn't have as good a season as some people might have liked. But I really love the versatility he brings on this roster. He and Richardson, to me, are the two young guys, along with Bam Adebayo, that I would not want to see leave if I'm the Heat. I need those guys to be part of my foundation going forward if I'm the Heat. But I guess if you got a chance to get a star, you have to consider it. And those are the kind of young assets somebody's going to want in return. They're going to want your most valuable young assets, price-wise and talent-wise, in a deal, potentially. So where would you see the Heat finishing overall in the division if you had to pick right now? I assume they're the second-best team Mm -hmm. behind... Uh, Washington, but they're in the mix with Charlotte. You know, I think Charlotte has finished out of the playoffs the last couple of years, but is there as far as talent? And obviously they have a new coach that there's a variable there, right. but I think Charlotte is in the mix with Miami and Washington. You know, Washington has the potential to jump into four or five, but I think Charlotte and Miami are in that six to nine or 10 range in the Eastern Conference okay. that, you know, we'll, we're just going to have to wait and see and see what happens. Well, Washington is the next team up on our list here in the Southeast Division. The AC last year, shoe got squashed the first round last year by the Raptors. I don't know if there's a team in the history of sport that's as far away from who they think they are internally <laughs> and what they've been in reality. And I, and I don't mean that to knock the Wizards. I only say that because John Wall and Bradley Beal go into every season believing they're going to the finals. Not the conference finals, the finals. Like the way they talk and the way they carry themselves, they're always talking about their team being the best. We're right there with whoever the best team is. And he's, it hasn't happened. They haven't won 50 games. They have not reached the 50-game win plateau since these guys have matured as a group. You get rid of Marcin Gortat after it was clear he and John Wall were no longer on a peaceful accord. Dwight Howard is now your man in the middle. You add Austin Rivers and Jeff Green. Nice pickup in Thomas Bryant, I think, is a you know utility big man. Drafted Troy Brown with the first pick, a guy who a lot of people loved in the lead-up to the draft last year. Does the makeup of this Washington team strike you as one that's capable of coming close to fulfilling the destiny they believe they have as a group in terms of being one of the best teams in the East. I have a pretty optimistic outlook for them Mm -hmm. this year in regard to where they finished last year. Okay, It's funny how you talked about how they think they're better than they are. They always do. I mean, and I give them credit for that. I think that's an admirable quality. But But the thing is, they don't take care of – last year, they especially, they didn't take care of – business against the teams that yes. they thought were beneath them, yes. right? They were 20 and 15 against the 12 teams that finished below 500. You know, that was the most losses by any team that finished above 500 against teams that finished below 500. Wow. So they didn't take care of business. In games played between the 18 teams that finished above 500 last year, the Wizards had only 
one fewer win than the Raptors. The Raptors were 24 and 21 in those games. Mm-hmm. The Wizards were 23 and 24 in those games. They were right around 500 against all the other teams that finished above 500. Mm-hmm. They can't just get up for the, the good teams, right? They have to have a better mentality about consistency and taking care of business. Hopefully they will have John Wall for more than 41 games this year. Right. And I think even in the games that he played, he wasn't the same. Like he averaged three and a half fast break points uh, per 36 minutes last year, down from 5.9 the year before. Mm. So he was not the terror on the break that he has been in the past. He remains one of the worst pull-up jump shooters in the league. And so that's something that's just there. And I'm not saying that he, he had a down year in that regard last year. He just got to get better. But I think Howard will help them defensively for sure. He is still a rim protector uh, on that end of the floor. And this team ranked 27th in opponent field field goal percentage in the restricted area last year. So they could use some rim protection and they will get it with him. Mm -hmm. The question is what he offers offensively. And then finally, I'll say Otto Porter needs a bigger role. Right. You can argue that he's their best player. He's the most efficient guy on, on offense. Um, obviously, a, a lengthy defender who has had some success um, with some one-on-one matchups in the past. I would like to see him with the ball in his hands more. I'll give you this stat for you. Mm-hmm. According to Synergy stats, as pick-and-roll ball handler last year, Wall scored 0.7 points per possession on 6.7 possessions per game. Beal, 0.9 points per possession on 6.2 possessions per game. Porter, 1.03 on only 1.6 possessions per game. So basically, he ran two pick and rolls or shot the ball off of two pick and rolls per game. But that rate of, of better than a point per possession was basically a top 10 rate if you look at you know the league as a whole. I want to see him running the ball running through him, whether it be a pick and rolls or in the post or something. I think that's that's an opportunity for them to improve offensively. You do realize that John Wall is going to swing on you when he listens to that. <laughs> you just said you think that Otto Porter might be their best player. Overall, <laughs> if you take both cap, both sides of the floor, right. Wall and Wall especially creates for Porter. It creates a lot of his open shots. One of the reasons that Porter is a, uh, an efficient scorer, one of the best three point shooters in the league, is because he has John Wall as a point guard. I won't deny that at all. I just think he needs a bigger like if they can take some of those pick and roll possessions out of Wall's hands and put them on Porter's hand in Porter's hands. One, it'll help Wall. He'll be be less of a burden on him, sure. and maybe he'll be a little bit more efficient in his touches. And then you know Porter, I think, can take a step forward. He's getting paid like a star, right? Like, let's, yeah, but I mean, you know. I would hate to cast him in that light if it's not really who and what he is. I don't know that he's the dude that I want to turn my offense over to every now and then just because he's efficient in the limited opportunities he's gotten. I mean, but it's an interesting. There would be some diminishing returns, yeah. I'm sure. How do you but, get better uh, if you're the Wizards without adding another dynamic player who could create for himself? Do you allow some of that for Otto Porter or someone else that's already on the roster? And that's a dilemma that Scott Brooks will have to figure out. I'm curious to see what kind of impact Austin Rivers has on this team off the bench. Yeah, I mean, this this, yeah, this team was not did not have a very good bench last yeah, year. Yeah, they're much improved. Or the year before. With Jeff Green and, and Rivers and Bryant. And Oubre has to get better. I mean, he yeah. had he was awful down the in the second half of last season. And so if he recovers from that, I mean, he shot 37% after the All-Star break, including the playoffs. And that, you know, that was just, you can't have that and have a decent bench. And so... Yeah, I'm, I'm optimistic about the bench as well. Does the depth on that bench maybe mitigate some of the disaster stuff we saw from Oubre and some of those other guys? Like when you now have Jeff Green and, and some more of these players off on this bench, maybe Oubre doesn't have to feel like he's trying to do as much as he's as he does sometimes when he's got other quality players playing with him on that second unit. Sure. Sadoransky has to get comfortable again. I like again Sadoransky, back. by the way. He did a decent job filling in for Wall yes. last season. Everybody ate when he was the point guard. Yeah, if you looked at the Wall, the games they had Wall versus the games they didn't have Wall, they weren't exactly much better within the games that Wall played. Mm-hmm. So it wasn't about his absence entirely last year. It was, like I said, it was about taking care of business. I'm going to go ahead and apologize to John Wall now. With the bench additions, it gives them a little bit more versatility. So, if you know, they can maybe play Marquis. Morris at, at center a little bit mm-hmm. and, and play small ball and go get offensive in that in that sense. Last thing on the Wizards here, and I'm, I want to make sure I phrase this right. If things don't go as planned, which we <laughs> admitted they haven't gone as, pl- you know, as John Wall and Brad Beal, Bradley Beal have planned them. If if things go sideways and there's not a an obvious culprit, does this become yet another check mark in the bag column for Dwight Howard, no matter what he does? Because, I mean, you look at his numbers in Atlanta, he was productive. 
but he was seen as the guy who held him back. In Charlotte, double-double again, but a locker room problem, a chemistry issue. I mean, is Dwight at the point in his career and at, at the state of his basketball existence where no matter what he does, no matter how productive he is, he's going to be seen as the guy who doesn't allow his team to, to reach the heights they should? I hear what you're saying, and like, yeah, a lot of teams have given up on him at the end of a, a season mm-hmm. in the last, what, four or five years? Yes. L.A., Houston, everywhere he's been since he left Orlando, he's kind of been, he's worn the black hat out on his way out of town. But hey, you know, the Wizards are the ones that chose to bring him in, right. you know, knowing what they know. Yeah. The Wizards themselves had issues probably as just as disappointing as Dwight Howard last season. Right. If things don't go well, like if they are still like an eight or not, you know, seven, eight, nine in the East, which uh, a seating which would belie their talent. I think they have the talent to be in the four, five, six range. Then it's it's more about the group as a whole, I think, than Dwight Howard. Right. Like he's not exactly ruining a team that is as disappointing as this one was last year right like so and then the question is what do they do like is there a is there eventually a wall beal breakup and i would assume it would have to be beal that leaves because of the the contract that john wall has so we'll see i mean he's you know they gave him that extension that pays him like a lot of money over the next uh five years <laughs> the guy's set to make 47 million dollars at the end of this contract yeah. I, like i said i'm optimistic but you know last year was not encouraging and having a healthy john wall isn't doesn't solve all their issues right moving along in our preview of the southeast division you mentioned them a, a couple times already Shu. it's that charlotte team that a lot of people didn't know what to make of the past couple of years a team that looked like they should for all intents and purposes be a playoff team and didn't make it just kept coming up short if i told you a 36 win team added bismack biombo tony parker miles bridges and Devonte graham let's just take those four guys and add them to the mix that you already have of Kimball Walker, Marvin Williams, Michael Kidd, Gilchrist, Nick Batum, Cody Zeller, Malik Monk. You add it to this core group of guys. If I gave you those names and said, look, this is what we're bringing in the summer, now we're set. Would you look at them and say, all right, good, they're ready to go now? What if you dipped into your analytics, you know, you went into your Excel sheet and you said, well, you know, they actually had the point differential of a team that was 42 and 40 last year. They weren't real, you know, they were 36 and 46. Right. But a lot of that was late game execution, and they were really closer to a 500 team. Then I'd say, you know what? They have a shot. You know, as you pointed out, there needs to be improvement from within. Mm-hmm. That means Batum has to recover from a couple of rough seasons and play better. Michael Kidd Gilchrist has to become whatever. You know what? They play Friday night, the first night of the preseason. pre-season They're yeah. on NBA TV. I'm kind of fascinated to see, you know, who starts. Basically, yeah. um, James Brago has said it's wide open. Kemba Walker is my starting point guard, and that's Everything all I'll else tell you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, I think Zeller, I think I'd be shocked if Cody Zeller is the starting center. Would he start Frank Kaminsky over Marvin Williams? I don't know. And then the wings is wide open. Like, I like probably the combination of Batum and Jeremy Lamb. Mm. But I'm fascinated to see. I didn't realize. I was just looking, you know, taking do, taking some notes. I didn't realize that Lamb is already in his seventh season in the league. Like, I blew my mind a little bit. And mm. I, he's become a decent shooter. It's a big season for him. He's in the last year of his deal. Malik Monk is a potential a, a guy who can show improvement. You know, we know he's a gunner. The question is, can he be efficient in his gunning? And it's always something to strive for. Yeah, and then of course it's the last year of Kemba Walker's contract, like, and the last year of a, a cheap contract for Kemba Walker. Yeah. So there is some pressure to sort of one make him want to stay and and stick around because everybody else, all their other veterans, are under contract for another year. Is assuming they exercise their player options and. You know, he's going to get paid a lot more next year, no matter if whether he stays or leaves. Somewhere else, yeah. I think it's an interesting season for these guys. I mean, Kaminsky is another guy in the last year of his rookie deal. Like, can he be less of a defensive liability than he was? You know, he's become a decent shooter, but not decent enough to make up for the other end of the floor. Right. Do you think that with Borrego coming in, that there's going to be some tangible system change that you can see with this team? Because that was the one thing about them with Clifford, Steve Clifford as coach, that I think a lot of people struggle with. There was just no identifiable style of play that they had that you could say all right this is what the Hornets do and this is you know this is kind of what they lean on they ran pick and roll Kemba Walker and Dwight Howard or Cody Zeller I mean they were a heavy pick and roll team I think 
they will continue. I mean, Kemba Walker is is who he is. I mean, he's yeah. a dynamic ball handler who can shoot off the dribble, who can get to the basket, and who can pass when he draws the attention. So I think that won't change. The question is if there's a second guy that can take some of the load. And then so when you run a pick and roll with Kemba Walker, the defense can't just put all of its attention on him yeah. because if he swings the ball somewhere else, there's a second guy who can really take it take advantage of a rotating defense so i'm curious about that and then defensively you know improved in- incredibly in steve clifford's first year but then they sort of slipped after that so they have to sort of regain that edge that they had defensively playoff team or not for the charlotte Hornets? is there borderline you know i think assuming cleveland falls out it's it's charlotte or detroit jumping up assuming miami yeah, if you assume miami stays in and you assume that cleveland falls out it's detroit or charlotte and I guess I would favor the Pistons, but I definitely keep an open mind as far as the Hornets. You know, as, as uninspiring, I guess, as they are, I think they still have the potential to be a pretty good team. Like everyone, you know, we've all kind of assumed that the Cavaliers are just going to fall out of the playoffs. I don't <laughs> – the more I think about it, the more I don't know. I don't know if – that they fall out so much as somebody else overtakes, somebody else rises up to take that spot. I just think like teams like Detroit and Charlotte have more that they can count on, right? especially defensively, because I don't know where Cleveland's getting defense from. But also offensively, I think, you know, Charlotte, Kevin Love is as great as he is. How is he going to be able to create for other guys? And I think Detroit and Charlotte have guys that can do better than that sure. and so we'll see i mean I'll, I'll keep an open mind and and i'm fascinated to see kevin love in that role now mm-hmm. again but I, I you would ask i'd put charlotte and detroit ahead well let me see you let me see if you can open have an open mind about this next team the orlando magic with steve clifford as their head coach bringing in his brand of you know pick and roll ball back to orlando he's a guy who's got history with that franchise and the one thing that sticks out to me about them is they've been in search it seems like of a point guard, of a start, you know, of, of a starting caliber point guard, they can turn things over to to just run whatever it is they're going to run, and they haven't had that guy. Does trading for Jerry and Grant solve that problem? Is Jerry and Grant a starting point guard in this league? Do you? I think either Jerry and Grant or DJ Augustine, mm-hmm. whoever starts, is just a placeholder at this point. Right. And my question, is, you know, I was looking at, it, I was like, all right, maybe Evan Fournier or Jonathan Simmons play minutes at point guard i know simmons wow. did last year yeah um, with the second unit and fournier's a, a, a good playmaker a good ball handler i think their talent is in the front court right so yes. why if you're putting your best players on the floor i think you're gonna end up with minutes where fournier and or simmons play point guard up front they have aaron gordon jonathan isaac Mo Bamba and Vucevic. I think Aaron Gordon is a four. Um, he, I was looking. He played ninety three percent of his minutes at the four yeah, last four. year. It's what he he's is. He's a four, right? It's what he so is. then, how do you mix in Isaac, who you know only played twenty seven games last year? Bamba, who you just took a high lottery pick, and then Vucevic, who's your who's your veteran guy that's been there forever. I'd be curious if he just takes a back seat to development. I mean, he's in the last year of his deal, so they're not necessarily invested all that much in him anymore. I mean, I'm he's trade bait as far as yeah, I mean, I would think he would be trade bait if Yeah, I guess. If they throw in and say, Hey, we gotta get we gotta develop this core of Gordon, Bamba, and Isaac. I thought yeah. Isaac was one of the more improved players I saw in summer league you know first year yeah guys. i like yeah i think they have to let those guys play yeah. and especially isaac he is you know we've talked like the the kind of player that teams are looking for a uh, big and long versatile forward slash center who can maybe shoot from the outside you know that remains to be seen but right. i saw a little bit of summer league with him and bomba on the floor together and they were pretty disruptive defensively which i was encouraged by right when clifford took over in charlotte i sort of mentioned this briefly when you're talking about the hornets they, they went from 30th to 6th on defense in his first year. Right. There's a potential for advancement on that end of the floor for the Magic, who ranked 20th defensively last year. Yeah, I think they could put some sort of long and athletic lineups together that, that can be pretty good defensively. But like we've said, you know, a point guard is still a hole. The potential is there for Fournier and Simmons to play point guard, but that's not necessarily the long-term answer. <sighs> I hate to bring this up for fans of the Magic, and they'll tell you this isn't the case, but I don't care what they say is true. They're still hung over from Dwight Howard leaving. They have not. They haven't done a thing since he left. I mean, the playoff drought has been since he left. Yeah, and it's the it's the longest in the Eastern Conference right now, six years. And I know they've had some starts and stops, some you know some reboots. I know John Hammond. I know 
what kind of work he does, you know, in terms of foundational building in the NBA. He's he knows what he's doing. Jeff, they know what they're doing. But what's the missing piece? Like, what is the glitch down there? What have they not? I mean, done they had Orlando some high to... picks, right? Yeah, they they've had, had high Oladipo. picks. Oladipo, they gave up on Oladipo, exactly. and and then Peyton. No, for Peyton, they you know didn't. They were right to give up on Peyton, I think, when they until did until he cut his um... hair. <laughs> and now he's killing it. Yeah, so like, yeah, they've had some swings and misses with those high picks, or not? You know, Oladipo actually wasn't a swing and a miss. They just they just gave up. Yeah, they, they gave up actually on. a base hit where they stopped running the bases. Yeah, and Gordon is the one guy, right? That they they have yeah. from that that they've developed. And so I, you know, I think they were almost forced to in, keep investing in him. Although I think his contract is reasonable, but yeah, there's still a couple pieces away, you know, yeah. it's the longest drought in the Eastern conference. And I think it pretty sure it's going to continue. It's going to be, it's going to go to seven. It's, it's going to be seven years now. Yeah. I just think in addition to Gordon, we got to, Isaac or Bamba have to show signs of being a potential star. I'm, I'm just saying not necessarily a superstar or anything like that. I'm just saying a big enough star that helps you start digging out of this thing. Six seasons with yeah. nothing. Yeah. A little more pressure on, on Isaac in that it's his second year, right? obviously. And he's probably obviously the more skilled offensive player. So. Sure, sure. I don't even have to ask about Orlando's prospects. You've already buried them before their first <laughs> preseason game. Um, I keep an open mind. Like, Cliff, like he could he could make a huge difference defensively, and that could take them up, you know, some spots in the East. No, I'm not. I'm listening. Sometimes you have to look at it for what it is. You don't have the pieces to be something more than what you are. And I think that applies for not only Orlando, but also the, the last team that we'll talk about in the Southeast Division, which is Atlanta. You talk about a team that has torn it down to the supports from a 60-win season of Eastern Conference Finals appearance a few years ago. They are all the way back down at the bottom shoot. F- you know, 15th seed last year with a 24-58 and 58 record. I don't know that they're any better now. Dennis Schroeder's gone. You know, they had Carmelo in theory. I don't think they even printed up Melo jerseys, you know, for the team store. If you're buying... The Trey Young, Kevin Herter, Omari Spellman nucleus in their 2018 draft when they cashed in on all those picks. Cole Aldrich and Vince Carter and Justin Anderson and RJ Hunter and Alex Lynn, Jeremy Lynn. Like, is this just window dressing for a distant future? Or are they serious in thinking that they can add those guys around this young core group of guys with John Collins and Torian Prince and these guys and be competitive this year? Uh, no, I don't think they're competitive. I think they're clearly well probably the worst team in the east i will give the uh the knicks without Kristaps porzingis a, ch- a shot at that title as well but yeah i think it's just about the young guys you know yeah. it's um you know john collins uh can be really good he was really good finisher actually as a rookie um trey young i will keep an open mind and give him a year or two right before i i totally trash the uh <laughs> <laughs> the draft day trade, you know, when December or January this year, when Luka Doncic is the best player on an improved team in the Western Conference and Trey Young is shooting 35%, I will still hold my tongue and say, all right, let's just give him a, a year in the league plus a summer of work and then we'll see where he is next year. I'm curious about Huerta, though. I like him. Kevin Herter is a good player. He He's going to be a good player. A, I, I don't know a, right away, but he's going to be a good player. I know he can shoot. Like, I was watching him at the rookie yes. photo shoot. He's got a terrific stroke. But as a sick, I'm curious to see if he can defend. Because if he's there, like, Clay Thompson, you know, six seven shooting guard. Let's remember, Clay, Clay Thompson is a plus on defense. And so I'll be curious to see if Werther herder. is a herder. All right. Um, <laughs> do not watch college basketball. So anyway, right. herder, if he can defend. And if he can be a decent player on that end of the floor. Because he has the size to be a decent defender. It's just a... I don't know about his his quickness and his instincts and et cetera, et cetera. Right. But speaking of of wings who can defend, I you know this. I love Torian Prince, and I think he took a huge step forward last season, both mm-hmm. in shooting and in playmaking. I will watch Hawks games to see his continued development. Right. He is basically the next you know great three and D wing in this league. Really, that's high praise. John Schumann hyping him up like that. I gotta <laughs> I gotta make sure I tweet that out. We don't know. A ton of about Lloyd Pierce as a coach in terms of we know where he's been, but we don't know what sort of philosophy he's going to bring in a rebuilding situation necessarily when it's his to run. Does he take a lot of those tenets that they used in Philadelphia and try and apply those to a situation here? Or is this more of Travis Schlenk's vision of how you build and based on his time with the Warriors and what they did to become an elite level team? Like whose vision 
wins out in this situation? Is it the coach who's having to manipulate this talent or is it the GM whose job it is generally to plot that long-term vision for a franchise? Well, hopefully they're they're fairly cohesive in their mm-hmm. work. We talked about it with, I think, the Knicks and the Suns where it's like, all right, you have a team that's bad. You have a new coach. Look at the Philadelphia example where Brett Brown came in six years ago now and st- established a culture, established a mindset, and established a way that they're going to play on offense and on defense, even when they had no talent, and built the foundation. And like we've said before, five years later, they're still playing the same way. They just have much more talent. Right. And because they sort of built that foundation, it was it was easier to add talent to it and you know hit the ground running, basically, when that talent came in. And Lloyd Pierce was there from the beginning in Philadelphia. I mean, he was there right at, in 2013 when they when Brett Brown was hired. Right. He was hired along with him. And so that encourages me like, OK, this is this is the team that has a guy that was right there alongside what has become the the prime example of how to build something from scratch. Interesting. I sensed a little hesitation on your part about Trey Young. <laughs> and I don't know if it was just because of Doncic or is it because of Trey Young? Like, do you not? Uh, it's both. Okay. I think it's both. I think one, I like what Doncic is, like just mm-hmm. as a 6'8 playmaker and slash shooter. I think there are plenty of people in the league that believe he should have been the number one pick in the draft. I think that's a legit opinion, and I think we're going to be discussing that for years to come. And then the other thing with Young, I mean, yeah, maybe he's got the Steph Curry sort of um, package in that he can shoot off the dribble. If you can shoot threes on the, off the dribble, that is a huge weapon. Right. Because it just it gets the defense. The defense can't sit back. They have to get on their toes. And then not only it opens up things for your teammates, it opens up things for you as far as getting to the basket. So if he has that package, great. He's not the shooter that Steph Curry is yet. And maybe that develops. But the other thing is he's small. You know, he's he's it's difficult to build a solid defense around really small guards. Like it's we've talked about it before that how important size in the backcourt is to playing good defense and the 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 Warriors have you know uh, exceptional defensive talent around Curry but Curry is also a solid defender so I think with Young you have to see you know how much what he is offensively but also how much he gets taken advantage of on the other end of the floor right we need this for the record so people hear it you called Torian Prince the next great three and D. <laughs> maybe I mean, maybe I'll say the, maybe the next. I don't know why I was watching Hawks games at the end of last season, but I was. I saw clear and obvious development not only in his shooting but in his playmaking and his confidence with the ball. And I'm, you know, it, that's maybe the one redeeming value of last season in Atlanta is that Torian Prince got to handle the ball a little bit right. and develop that skill. And and obviously they're going to have another season like that of development. Collins, like I said, is a good finisher, but if he can start becoming a, a plus defender in the middle and a rim protector with all his bounciness, you know, that's that's one objective for this season. How do you write three and D in Schumann world? Cause I'm, <laughs> I'm making sure I put this out there just for the Hawks fans looking for a crumb to, to be excited about this year. I guess it's C-H-R-E-E dash... <laughs> A N D dash D. All right, you're the man. I just want to make sure. I'm just, I'm just doing. I'm making, just, yeah. All right. I'm just making sure. You're tweeting be this out. I want to know. All right. You know, people. Want to be- I, I'm, I'm a Tory and Prince fan. Yeah. In I fact, mean, I think I gave him some most. I gave him a most improved either second or third place vote. He didn't even go to Virginia Tech, and you and you're hyping him up like this. I'm impressed. I just, I just <laughs> tell you. <laughs> I don't know if you have an, an overarching number. For this division, which I think might be one of the more depressing divisions in the entire league. I don't know that this is going to be a group of teams that you look at at the end of the season and say, wow, they played over their skis. Like as a group, they're, you know, these teams were better than we imagined they'd be or they're, you know, I think they're going to be pretty much to script. You know, there's some clear rebuilding jobs in the Southeast. There's a Miami team that could maybe overachieve, a Charlotte team that could maybe claw its way into the playoffs and a Washington team that could be special or could be Washington could be a a playoff team but not a group that you project going beyond the first round necessarily what would be your I don't have an overarching uh stat for you Mm -hmm. I have a specific a specific trivia question for you okay all right all right so there are two players last year that averaged at least five points per game on drives five points per game on pull-up jumpers and five points per game on catch and shoot jumpers one of them is in the Southeast Division, mm-hmm. uh, or else we wouldn't be asking that question right now. 
The other is not. Two guys, both shooting guards. Five points per game on drives, five on catch-and-shoot jumpers, five on pull-up jumpers. Mm -hmm. What do you got for me? One of them is in is in the Central Division. Or, I mean, Southeast, Southeast Division. Yeah. One is... Yeah. Does he play on a team in Florida? Nope. Okay. Number... He's a clear Brad two. Brad Beal. No. Bradley Beal. Bradley Correct. Beal. It's got to be Bradley Beal. Who do you think the other guy is? The other guy is in the Pacific Division. Clay Thompson? Nope. I don't know. I have no idea. Grand Rapids own. What? Listen, don't just say a guy. You got to, you have to stipulate future star slash phenom, Devin Booker. Don't just, don't just say a guy. He's not just a guy. Ah, he's a guy. <laughs> I'm going to get you in so much trouble, John. Um, John Wall will not be inviting you to the family picnic. You're going to be officially adopted. Oh, I'm going to hang out family. with the princes. Yeah, I'm, I'm definitely going to the, the Tory and Prince family uh, reunion next summer. And the bandwagon. I, I hadn't heard that until today. The bandwagon for uh, bandwagon. Yes, I'm all aboard the bandwagon. People, are, we're going to we're going to take we're going to take on a lot more passengers this year. I feel. <laughs> I like it. This is a lot less depressing than I thought we'd be talking about the Southeast Division because of the teams, because I do the previews for NBA.com's uh, season previews on the Southeast and have for quite some time. It's, it was tough to wade through what their prospects might be for this season, but I'm you make me feel a little bit better. I'm going to try and keep his open mind an open mind like you are about so many of these players and teams to see what they do. We'll be back Monday with our Southwest Division preview, the final division preview in our series here on the Hangtime Podcast. In the meantime, make sure you check out Sean Powell's 30 Teams in 30 Days series. It's been up all month on NBA.com. Shoe, your, your one team, one stat series cranked up this week. The Sixers, Warriors, Lakers, Celtics, Suns, and Raptors. It's one of my favorite things that we do every year, get a chance to dig in on uh, the wacky mind of John Schumann on the one team, one stat series. And uh, if you haven't already, please subscribe to hang time on Apple podcasts and Spotify for episodes all season long of the show here. John, I appreciate you taking the time in your busy schedule. I know you're swamped right now with so much stuff, but still taking the time to dig in and make sure we crank up these season previews because this is good stuff to have just when you're talking about a, an overview of the league. I know everybody's locked into their own team. There are people that follow one team or a couple teams and they're, and they're dug in. But this is interesting to get a broader perspective of, of the league at large. So just hold on for one more of these previews. Southwest coming up on Monday. Give me one more burst of Schumanness on our last division preview, and I appreciate it. I'll be there. All right. Thanks, man. We'll see you right here next time on the Hangtime Podcast. Thanks for listening to the Hangtime Podcast, and be sure to subscribe on Apple Podcasts for a new episode every Thursday this season. And as always, say kuna matata. Tada.